Adam, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you? Where did you come from? Uh, Blairstown, New Jersey. You know, Meaning like you were born there. Well, I was born Long Island. Okay. Long Island then moved to Blairstown at the ripe age of three. I guess I meant where did you come from before you came literally over here? Ah, yeah, yes. That would be Blairstown, New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Were you out? Were you on the road with McGraw? This weekend? Oh, right now? Yeah. Today? That, I was yeah. in Nolensville. That, yeah, I was in Houston got last it. night got at the it. rodeo. Got it, got it. So in, you played the yep. rodeo with McGraw? Yep. Got up and, at 4.30 this morning. Oof. Yes, yeah, fun. Where Where did you wake up at 4.30? Here? Uh, or in Houston? In Houston. Oof. Hopped on a plane. Well, I wanted to see you. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that. That's just, <laughs> like, I wake up at 4.30, but I have to do that norm. It still sucks. Yeah. It sucks every day that I have to yeah. wake up at 4.30. But so to play the Houston Rodeo, that's pretty massive. Yeah. Like probably one of the more massive scenes, right? Totally. How many people they fit in there? 70,000? I, I don't know if it's 50. I think it might be 50. It's a lot, yeah, right? It's, yeah. Uh, so, so many questions, and I want to get to your influence on the sound of today's country music. We'll talk about your record. But just starting with the McGraw stuff, since that's, that's what we're here, you ever play and you know you hit a wrong note? <laughs> And you look around to wonder, well, I wonder if anyone else noticed I hit a wrong note. Yeah. Because as good as you are, even the, even LeBron misses, you know, oh, a 10-footer yeah. occasionally. Oh, yeah. Does that ever happen? Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is we have so many people up there on that stage that most people in the audience, I don't think, notice oh, it. Oh, no, I, I don't even yeah. notice. Yeah. But yeah, the guys in the band, if they have you in their mix, they notice. And we usually give a smile. I usually raise my hand when it's me. <laughs> you know, that was it's me. Like, it's like, yeah, I fouled. Yeah, yep, that was I, me. I, I committed the foul. <laughs> Do you, does McGraw, or is he so into it? If, let's say the drum, or Dino, who, you know, we've been friends for yeah. a long time. Let's say somebody does something that's just slightly different or off. Will he look at you and be like, okay, I, I, I caught that. Well, yeah. I mean, whether it's good or bad, he will turn around and give you one of those. So if it's really good, yeah. too, let's say oh, you're yeah. just, cr like, oh, you're yeah. feeling it yeah, one yeah, night. Yeah. yeah, if you're crushing it and he notices, he'll, he'll, he'll give you that look. And, and if you're crushing it in a bad way... He'll uh, give you that look. Too. Yeah. Uh, it, but it's never that. He never finds you like uh, James Brown used to do. Yeah, yeah. He never gives you fi the fine. Find everybody five, for dollars every yeah. mess up. We, you know, in our studio, on our radio show, you know, we have, I have my desk and everybody sits around me. A similar environment where everybody's going, but if somebody's like really on, you don't want to call it out and be like, you're killing it because you're almost <laughs> jinxing it. Right. And you also yeah. don't be like, hey, you're sucking today. But there will be a glance if somebody's crushing it where I'm like, Hey, that's great. Yeah. Probably the same thing. You're a team. It's the same thing, yeah. Player, sure. player on the team's killing it. So your guitar story, let's go back to where you came from, uh, to be such an excellent player, because you've also played the drums, or you do play the drums. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, guitar. Like, where did your fascination w with music and, you know, instruments start? It started with the records in my house as a kid. Namely, like Peter Frampton comes alive, things like that. You have that. one of the. <laughs> you ever play well, one of those? I do. I have. I have one of those now. Yeah. I never. For years, I didn't, and I always wondered what they look like, how to use them, you know. And I still don't even know if I know exactly how to use it. You and put it called, in your mouth, and your teeth start falling out. What's it called? Uh, talk box. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, for those that don't know, on Frampton comes alive, he's playing, and it's obviously live, and he starts. <laughs> and the crowd's like, ah! yeah. And then yeah. like like. I think about that too. When I think of like this, I guess the seventies. Would that be early seventies? That was seventy five. Okay. Yeah. That's the music. Frampton comes alive is an album that I really think about. Yeah. So you were listening to that is it because yeah, your parents it, were. My, well, yeah, it was in the house. Um, you know, my brother had ELO's greatest hits. Def Leppard, Pyromania was like the first vinyl I remember. Beatles records, you know. But the audience on the Frampton comes alive and Clapton just one night, a record my dad brought home for me. The audience spoke to me. Like, that attracted me, too. Like, I got chills from the sound of the audience. And, and so that kind of kind of makes sense because I love being in front of a crowd. Did you have people in your house that also played music that could, um, you know, preliminarily lead you a direction? Not really. Not really. I, my, my brother was a drummer, but he passed away early. I was 11. He was 14. So I didn't really have this ultra-cool musical influence to keep me from listening to some less cool music that I listened to in the 80s, unfortunately, you know. Did, so. with your brother being a drummer and him passing away, was your family at all like, hey, maybe you don't do music? No, my my parents uh, always supported me. I, they got behind me every everything I wanted to do. So when did you, what did you get first? You played drums or you played guitar? Guitar, yeah. 
Did yeah. you play so you could play with your brother and have like a mini little house? No, I just, I mean, it happened the same Christmas. He got his drum set the same year I got a guitar. Is it because he wanted drums more and then so you got a guitar? I think so. Yeah, I was always air <laughs> guitar and brother. bouncing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, unfortunately, I don't have many memories of my brother. I was only 11. So memories go away. Right. You, know, you have to look at pictures to have some of that stuff come back, you know, a lot. When you first start playing, do you, because my story is not like yours at all because I am terrible. I play for comedy purposes, right? Right, right. But I went and bought a chord sheet at Walmart. From the po There should be posters where you'd a big box, you slap them, and I said, I'll take that poster. But it was a chord sheet from Walmart, and I learned how to do my hands. Right. You, where did it start for you as far as learning how to actually play? Yeah, I took lessons from a, a friend named Scott Pensett. Uh, he was 18. He was, the, he was the teacher in town, and I was five. So I took lessons from him till I was... Oh, five, about, you started yeah, lessons, Yeah, huh? until about 14. Then when I was 15 or 16, I took from a Berkeley guy for about a year. I should be way better at what I do. <laughs> you yeah. know? As a five-year-old taking lessons, what I think of is when I was 19 trying to train myself, even I was like, oh, my fingers. Yeah. How are you five and you're still bad at something yet you continue? Because playing guitar is not something you just go, hey, I'm pretty good at this. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't remember, man. I mean, five years old, <laughs> sticking with anything yeah, at five. They tell me I was five. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. it, you know? What, so when did you actually start to play music that people could understand? I guess that would be chords. Yeah, well, it'd be my, uh, I, I think by the time I was 10 or something, I was making sense of it. Yeah. I was in bands at eight, the age of 14. That's yeah. wild that you were 10 and you were already pretty good at playing guitar. Yeah, it was decent. When I was 14, my first band was with the 17 and 18 year olds. Were you yeah. the kid that was known as the musical kid? Yeah. I mean, that for was sure. your that for was sure. kids are athletic. Yeah, yeah. Mo most of the other kids were older. There weren't many my age that I, I remember. Well, I guess there were. I I tunnel vision, man. I just went for it the, my whole life, so. Electric but, guitar, acoustic yeah, guitar. Yeah, electric. Well, the first one was acoustic, but the electric came real quick, like a year or two after. And yeah. the thing with the electric, when I started to tinker, it's a different, it's the same instrument, but it's a different instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I basically only play acoustic now because my shows, who cares? I'm doing comedy. Um, but the first couple times I picked up an electric, I was like, wow, these notes will stay longer. Yeah. Like you hit it and it doesn't go away. Yeah. And so as a kid, did you identify, once you started playing the electric guitar, is did you identify with it more as like this instrument speaks to me a little more? I think so. Yeah. I, I think just the fact you could turn it up and crank it my first band were it was a metal band you know, we were playing slayer and metallica first cover song i think i did was detroit rock city and it was just that that rush of hearing the drums and trying to turn your amp up over the drums and all that it's just amazing so what's the feeling. goal when you're 16 or 17 years old to be an artist you know did you want to you want to lead a band did you want to be a solo artist i just wanted to rock man yeah I wanted to be a rock star so you know. then what do you do? When and when do you do it? Do you move at 18, 19? Yeah, pretty much. You know, we were we were in a band that moved down here cuz a manager wanted to make us stars. And it was kind of a rock band, more like Billy Joel meets a soul blues thing. Uh, the lead singer played piano and sang, but yeah, the guy wanted to make us stars and we didn't have any thought in our head of, oh, well, it's Nashville, we can't go down there, we're not country. So we just came down, you know. So who is this guy? How did he find you guys? Um his name was Terry Sasser. I don't know where he is um, now, but he told me I'd never work again in this town when I quit that band. Okay, I want to get to that. <laughs> but how does he find you guys? Uh, it was it was a bass player. Um, so a friend of ours, Justin Tockett, who's a great producer down in Louisiana, he came up and played bass on our first recording in our singer's basement. But where does and, this guy find... But who... Like, how do you guys get together? Like, what? I'm just curious about this first band. Oh, the band. Yeah, like, together. how do you yeah. know these guys? Uh, man, it was, um, I think, if I remember correctly, I met the singer Nathan because Scott, who was my teacher, was also played with me at that point. I, I don't think I was taking lessons anymore. I think we were just playing together. And he knew his father, I think. And that, that's how we so all So organically. Kind of, that's, yeah, it was total, yeah. total organic. And you weren't sure. a singer? I was not. Did you do background I, vocals? I did a little bit. Did you have, were you younger than the other guys? No, we were all the same age, that band. Did you yeah. want to sing? Uh, I always wanted to sing. Yeah, yeah. It I mean, me crazy if I was like, yeah, like I'm no, good, I, I, I have always for years, you know. Um, I just wasn't that good at it and wasn't that comfortable with it. So when do you guys start 
playing and making 20 bucks or so? Um, never. Really? <laughs> you didn't really? I mean, we the- went into New York City and played the bitter end, but that wasn't to make any money that I remember. Maybe Nathan's dad pocketed it. I don't know, you know? So how does this sasser find you or hear you? So that time? was Justin. He came up, played on a recording, but he had already moved down here, um, and he was a road bass player for an act, and this guy was managing her. Mm. And he played him the recordings. Now, was this guy, he was already in management, but do you feel like he actually heard something or he just wanted to expand his brand a little bit with the band? I think he heard something. Yeah, we definitely had something. You know, and we were young and good looking and, you know, I well, some of us were. So <laughs> You all moved down. Do you live together? Yeah. yeah. Shelby Street, East Nashville, five guys, one house, less than $100 each in rent. Boy, I, the five guys thing, though, and I'm assuming that you're splitting it five ways almost equally mm-hmm. i mean equally yeah just depending on what the band is uh not a lot of money there no five hundred dollars a month it was great you know some of, we were waiting tables doing stuff like that you know bartending you move down and do you go right to a studio um you know we did you talking about that band yeah because so, because you moved we, here. we started playing yeah okay. um I don't know if we did any recordings. I, I jumped into recording with some other people and my own blues stuff at the time because I wanted to sing, you know. But we played Jack's Guitar Bar. I don't know if you remember that place. Mm-hmm. Um, and Keith Urban used to play there. And I think Lucinda Williams, Kim Ritchie, Steve Earle, they were all staples there. Bullet Hole in the Windows on Nolensville Road right by 440. So this band obviously didn't work out. Yeah. Or you, you wouldn't be here in this capacity now. Yeah. Um, and then, so why does the guy say you'll never work in this town again? I think I was the second to quit, and he was frustrated. I think. Who says that though? You'll never work in this town again. <laughs> that guy. I, I think. Mean, I think he's hiding out on an island. Yeah, I mean, that's just maybe that's just such that's an old school thing to say. Yeah, um, yeah, it was. Were you scared that you may never work in this town again? No. Okay. No. So then, what do you do? You're here. You're here. Yeah. And you've gotten to know some folks. You you kind of understand the culture a little bit. The band is not, you quit the band. So what do you do? Well, you know, I played with everybody that I could play with, whether it was for free or paid 25 bucks here and there, and then just started to grab gigs and most importantly landed a job at Woodland Studios in East Nashville. And that job was playing? That job was answering phones, but, (laughs) (laughs) but we could use any of the three studios we wanted to on our own music if we had an engineer with us. And um, the owner, Bob Solomon, he had a, uh, a publishing company, and he used me and my friends as the band, the house band. So that's how we cut our teeth as session musicians. So, so he let you use the studio mm-hmm. as long as you had an engineer. And as long as we answered the phone. But you still got paid money. Yeah. For answering the phone. Yeah, he, was, pretty, he was awesome. He that's was a great. great gig. It was awesome. For someone in music yep. that's starting out. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. So you talk about the publishing and... You would be the house band. So somebody writes a song. Are you doing demos? Yeah, exactly. Did you remember, and again, I'm going to kind of tickle the memory a little bit. Did you ever cut any demos that turned out to be something pretty cool way later? We There was nothing to, of note in that batch, unfortunately. I wish there was for Bob, <laughs> but, the, but there wasn't that, that I remember. So you do yeah. that for how long? Um, a few years, a few years, and then started to grab little gigs here and there. And some of the guys I met through there um, started to hire me and... and um, and then, yeah, gigs, I'd, I'd take a gig, I'd come back, I'd take a gig, I'd come back. Then I worked at a music store for a little while downtown uh, that's not there anymore. And um, Gig World, the midnight window. It was called Gig World? Gig World, and we had a midnight window. Like, I would stay there after hours. If somebody broke, broke strings, drumsticks on Broadway, they'd come running down to the window and give me five bucks and I'd hand them there. Wow. You know, it was, it was a cool little... Thing, you know when you're saying you're playing gigs are you going out and playing guitar for for people that need one pretty quickly yeah lo- well locally um i never did like crazy fast pickup gigs because i never did a lot of cover songs it was usually people's original music and you know stuff with a couple rehearsals and a couple shows yeah you know one of my favorite ones was millard powers um he's uh, counting crows bass player now power pop dude really really awesome that was fun so Todd, was he a soul? Was he an artist? He was. He, he was like he had this. He had him. this record. I don't think he ever put it out, but he played every instrument himself, and it was just really cool power pop stuff. At this stage, you've worked in a studio. 
and you've, you know, introduced yourself to that world. I mean, you kind of, that's, that's, you were more than introduced. Like, I mean, you were kind of running, you know, that spot. Yeah. Because you're, you're getting to use it yourself. You're working with other people. Uh, do you start to go, hey, maybe I want to, like, really dial in to be a guitar player more than an artist? Yeah, I did. And, and that kind of swept me away from there because I would get inspired hearing these guitar players through the wall. You know, it was the first time I heard Jay Joyce. You know, I think, I think he was working, it was either Flaming Red he was working on or Radney Foster, See What You Want to See, both two of my favorite albums ever. Um, and that's, you know, the first place I heard Jay. And, and I, I hadn't even heard of Iodine because I was a little late to Nashville for that, his, his rock band. Um, but yeah, that, that place was definitely the launching pad. What do you remember about seeing Jay Joyce before he became Jay Joyce, the, uh, the super successful producer? Yeah, I remember a lesson he taught me. And that was, you know, after hours, I'd go in and peek at the gear and see, you know, what he had. And he was in the kitchen one morning. I was like, hey, Jay, man, so what are you using that pedal for and this pedal? And he looks at me and he's like, hey, man, just get your own thing. And I was part, partially a little crushed, but I kind of took it to heart and I was like, okay, I'm cool to do my thing. And I got to use that on somebody, a younger player later in life. So that was cool. And him yeah. saying, do your own thing or use your own thing was him saying, identify what you do. Yeah. And what you're good at doing and what you can get better at and do that. Yeah. And I think that's why I kind of got where I went is I just did what I do. And I think that's kind of what, gets new session guys in the door and girls too the the session experience is wild because you guys are so good and, I, and i'll remove myself and remove you from you know the mcgraw stuff and i do want to get back to you being a guitar player on a stage and playing live music but the session stuff is tough because you got to be the best of the best yeah because the best is out on the road playing with pretty good acts mm -hmm. the best of the best Stays in Nashville. You don't have to travel very far and go to studio to studio. Yeah. That, and they can do that because they are elite. Yeah, it's great. I, I feel like I'm an, an imposter. I was on the phone with a friend the other day. He goes, do you have imposter syndrome like I do? I'm like, yeah, I do. Why, how did I get here? There's so many guys that are brilliant, technically amazing. And, you know, I, I think I've heard the, room, the uh, secret of the room full of the best musicians in the world is they all think they're the worst. Which, for the most part, I think is true, except for a few guys. I won't name them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds to this point like you are living a musician life, kind of balancing around, learning, getting better, slowly climbing whatever the wild ladder is of, of a creative. But when did, this is a word that doesn't really exist in either one of our lives, but when did any sort of stability start to happen? That would be the big and rich days. You know, a little before that, you know, John and John Rich and Big Kenny started hiring me on all their demos. I I was in a rock band with with Big Kenny called Lovejoy. Met John Rich through that. Start he had his publishing deal with Warner Chapel. They used me on all their demos. I started getting on records because I was on these demos of John's. Um, and then they had the Big and Rich record. So the ba -da -da -da, and I'll play it now. Da -da 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 -da. This is da -da -da. Here you go. <laughs> So 2004, this is Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. Now, um, having friends that are, are good guitar players, you know, tone is, it's like the, it's the thing. You want to have your own tone. You want to have a specific tone. If the tone's just slightly off, it ain't right. But there's a distinct tone to this. Um, and I don't think I had heard it prior in popular country music. Yeah, I think it was new for country music for sure. Yeah. Did you come out of the box and go, hey, I think this is the tone? Like, what? what's that? Man, I, you know, John actually had that riff, and that was just me playing it, you know. And that was a common tone for me that I used when I was just playing rock and roll. You know, I hadn't really done much country music at that time. But the riff and the tone are different, meaning yeah, yeah. you can have the riff, yeah, but you may not have the tone. You could have True. something lighter. You could have something, uh, you know, so, but that is a, it's hard to explain what that tone is, but that's uh, a little grittier yeah. than I think I had heard leading up to that point. Yeah, I think so. And it also gives that song, the riff is great, 
but the tone of that 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 opening riff gives that song such texture and you cut the song do you cut the demo with that i guess or did it change when you actually go into the studio i think that was the demo i think it, the demo became the record i don't so, think we ever did an actual demo really? of save a horse you know it, it, a lot of those john and kenny songs were demos that were really the record i think i, I don't think we did a version of that ahead of time like redneck woman we did a demo on i didn't play on the record but and then like hicktown jump into another song I played on the demo, which is why I played on that record for Aldine. This is like the the baby that grows into the adult later. Yeah. You know, because and this is the first space you kind of hear it. Um, I'll play a couple more of these. This is uh, Mississippi Girl by Faith Hill. And you co-wrote this with John Rich, by I the did. way. Yeah. yeah. And we'll get to some Aldine in depth later, but here is Hicktown, 2005. Um, heavy rock influence. Yeah. I think when I think of Aldine, without knowing it until recently when I started to read more about you, I should think about you more because a lot of what you have done with him is what defines him. Yeah, I mean, a, a big percentage of the guitars on those records are me, you know, and I do am the, quote, band leader on the sessions, but, you know, everybody puts their input, and it's a sum of all parts for sure. So let's see here. <clears throat> A lot of Aldine. Give me lights, come on, Mike, please. I mean, that right, again, yeah. you hear that yeah. immediately. It's not just the riff. It's also the, the kind of dark, rocky tone yeah. of it. When someone hired, like an Aldine says, hey, come back in. We want you to do this. Do they expect that's what you're bringing now? Yeah. That's your thing. Yeah. I mean, for a while, I felt like people thought I was just the guy that did power chords in country music, you know, and, and didn't think I did anything else, you know. And granted, I gravitate towards that for sure, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely, you get known for what you first do, I think. Or yeah. you get, yes, you definitely get known <laughs> for what you first do, especially what you first do that, that, that works, that works yeah. wonderfully. <laughs> right, right. Right. Um, but Thanks. like Jay Joyce said to you, you know, do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you, so how would you describe your thing as a, as a player? I, I think I just play for the song. Like, I, I don't feel comfortable if I feel like I've played something before. Um, if I'm doing a part I know for sure I've played, I try to change it and do something different. If a, a songwriter or an artist sings me a lick and wants me to play it, and it's something I heard before I tell them, you know? And I think that's what most of the session guys and girls do is they play for the song for sure, you know? So you will say to an artist, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. If I really know for a fact I've heard it, or, or if I really have a deep feeling that there might be a better thing or a cooler thing. Ever you have know. someone meet you with, I do think so? Um, I, I think so, but nothing too stressful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, nothing too stressful. Let's run through some of these. Uh, Aldine burning it down. Girl, let's keep burning it down. Burning it down. Burning it down. And this song was, again, a, a slight pivot for Aldine musically. <laughs> yes. I mean, how responsible are you for being a part of that 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 brain? No, I'm not. I mean, that's Knox with his song picking, and you know, and a lot of times we do base what we're doing off the demo. That song in particular, if I remember correctly, that that uh, bam. mod part on the yeah. right, bam, 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 I had I played that for the whole take. You know, you could have looped it, but I think I think that's Kurt doing the left guitar, and then me on the right doing. You that can thing. hear a left and a right. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing Kurt and I have really gotten a cool magic thing down you know it's like we it's been him and I since Hick, Hicktown was the only one I played electric on the first record but record two through ten was him and I it's typically him left me right and then I stay and add stuff you know I'll add extra beef or most of the solos he's done a couple solos um so yeah I kind of know if it's left it's you, a main part on the left. It's sometimes him, usually him. You know, sometimes I'll double it. You know, I feel like you can't enjoy music anymore, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> That's why I'm singing my own songs yeah, again. I know, because I, I, man, I'm kind of tired of guitar, to be honest with you. Yeah, and, and best also best job in the world, but tired of it. Since you are in that part of it, I think you probably hear everything, and you are listening to little in switches and, j and right ear, left ear. That it's probably hard for you to separate and just go. <laughs> I'm just going to take this whole blanket of music as is. Yeah. Well, you know, 
yeah, there's a construction to it, and I'm so aware of it when it comes to this genre. You know, I actually don't listen to the genre I play most that that often. You know, I listen to stuff that just completely speaks to me. I'm more I'm more of a more attached to like a U2 style of writing, a left brain, you know, poetic kind of writing rather than a, a story about a truck, you mm-hmm. know. And no offense to country music, that's just what pulls me. Uh, and in that music, uh, I'm more thrilled with the things I hear because it's usually not of the formula that we kind of use here in Nashville. And probably recreates or influences what you do, which is what makes you different and successful. I mean, I don't listen to other radio shows. Yeah, right. I mean, I don't. Yeah, and I'm not you interested. probably don't listen to your own radio show. Never, when you're done with it. never. I don't. I mean, I would not. Do listen. you? Never. Do you? God Come no. On. It's because, but what I do listen to, I listen to different kind of podcasts that don't have to live the same structure. Right. And what I can do is pull things out of what other people do wonderfully into what I do. I think if I listen to other people do what I do all the time, I would just stay doing exactly what is being done. Right. Exactly. And so I feel like that's what you're doing as well. And what you have done to kind of reshape, you know, the music of popular country music right now is that you never chased being popular country music. No, and I never did, man. I think that's sure. that's the key, right? With trendsetters, they're not trying to set a trend. They just are so good at what they're doing that's a bit different. It then becomes the trend. Do you hear people? And don't say you don't say any names. I feel like people are kind of jocking your style a little bit at times. Well, you know, it's inevitable in this town. You know, you you'll take like. Uh, for instance, she's country. Um, I think Rob McNelly played on the demo. I played on the record. We changed the lick a little bit on the record, partly because I couldn't figure out one part of it. You know, so you get this thing where you're playing one guy's licks from a demo on a record. He's playing your licks from a demo on a record. We all start playing each other's stuff. So inevitably, you're going to start playing a little bit like your your friends. Don't you feel so, like, though, there are some producers that go, you should listen to Adam, and then we're going to do that. You're going to do that today. Well, yeah, record. I mean, people will, you know, people will tell me they want, like, a Bukovac thing, you know? And so it happens to all of us, you know? It's just, it's not, it could be on purpose, but, you know, it is what it is. It's just, if it works and that person's not, there's an old saying, one of the first guys I worked with in town, Ronnie Godfrey, piano player, I think he was in the Marshall Tucker band, um, he said, right now, they're saying, who's Adam? And in a little while, they're going to say, you got to get at him. <laughs> and they're going to say, you can't get at him. He's too busy. And then they're going to say, who's at him? <laughs> how, how, uh, how often are you doing studio work now? Uh, it's a little less because, you know, I balance tour. Um, I'm producing stuff. I'm doing my own records, my own projects. Um, my kids are about five hours from here, and I go visit them as much as I can. Uh, so yeah, not as much as it used to be, but I'm still working. I still get the calls, which is nice. Yeah, you know. I mean, it, you get the calls, and to get those calls, you got to be pretty freaking good. Because, like I said, my right, the elite gets to work in a studio in the air conditioning. The elite and the imposters like me. Well, I think we all have a little bit of that. <laughs> uh, uh, you're married to Katie Cook. I sure am. I did not know lottery that. from she, CMT. She I, loves you. Yeah, I love her too. Yeah. I did not know that. Uh, I think that's why you're most famous to me now. Well, Katie yeah. Cook's husband. I mean, come on. Holy crap, Adam Cook. Do um, you like you were influenced by jazz a bit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you feel like that? I'll just use the same word. Influenced your guitar style at all? A little bit, um, because I did learn a bit of improvisation from horn players at my my high school. That we had actual jazz guys from New York and Delaware Water Gap as part of our music department. So I did get a little bit of that in my in my blood. Always fascinated with people who like to play jazz because you got to be good and you got to be good at just rolling with it. Yeah, I wish I was really good at it. I'm I, I'm what I consider a faker at jazz, you know, and most people are unless they live it. Yeah, you know. So just play a couple half note half steps and you'll play jazz you know just end up on the right note and you're good your you know first sense of stability was big and rich do you go on the road with them for a while i did yeah oh my yeah. god it was a party but oh i signed my... a paper so i'm not allowed to say I, anything. oh my god <laughs> <laughs> no it was it was a lot of fun it, it had to be so much fun that it wasn't fun because you're tired of Overstimulation. Well, I learned about whiskey, yes, and uh, 
Never mind. <laughs> I, I just have a, uh, I have other yeah. friends or people that I know that have toured with them or yeah. toured, and it's just a lot. I don't remember a lot yeah. of it. You know, I mean, it seems like quite the party. Yeah, it was a party. It was great. Are you with them until they break up? Well, I kind of was. It, it was interesting. It was. Uh, it was two thousand end of two thousand seven or beginning of two thousand eight. I told Kenny I was quitting. And then Kenny kind of was going in that direction too. Him and John were kind of falling apart all at the same time. Um, and uh, but then they were still touring. And in two thousand nine, they asked me to go back out with them to cover that tour. So I went back out for that one year. Um, but yeah, I saw it all, every every part of it. So you discontinue the playing with Big Big and Rich, John and Kenny. Um, when did the Al Dean, when, when did that happen? Well, that all happened kind of simultaneously, um, you know, because I ended up being in Al Dean's showcase band because Knox knew me from John's demo sessions from Warner Chapel. And by showcase, uh, for those, and just to make sure I'm right, Al Dean was showcasing himself for a record deal maybe? or a, and, and He was. So you guys were playing in front of executives? Uh, yes, we were. And then we got offered a deal as a duo, which I turned down. Wait, huh? Yeah, and J- did, Jason you, likes to poke at me on that one. You and Jason were offered uh-huh, a deal. Uh-huh. That's my claim to fame. You were going to be the original Dan and Shay, and I know we, it. We would, it, we would have been, you know, Big and Rich's competition and Brooks and Dunn. I think we would have won. Much better looking. So, oh, you and Al <laughs> Dean are offered a deal as a duo. Uh-huh. What did Al Dean think about it? He was ready to go, and I had a rock band at the time, and I, I, I think. Maybe I was, I'm trying to, it, the timeline's a little blurry, but I had a rock band, a little bit of the Big and Rich stuff, but I was, I, I just didn't want to do it because I, I, I wasn't a country artist in my mind. I still, I didn't buy into me being a country musician at all. So was the duo, I'm trying to think of who to compare it to, and nothing I like musically, but bear with me for a second. In FGL, Tyler sings, BK occasionally sings mm-hmm. but mostly plays or were you you and jason both gonna be front facing singing who knows it no it was literally i did this showcase with him as a background singer playing acoustic guitar singing high vocals and somebody i think it was clay bradley came back after that showcase and offered us the deal so you there was no trying. plan no it was just wow. a it was just a an offer on the table we got a deal for you on the table right now you know and you didn't but, want to do it no and and the funny thing is i you know, talk to Jason, you know, like I say, he likes to poke at me about it, but we were on one of the last records we're working on, and he brought it up, and I said, man, it would just be the same as it is now. I should have I taken it, pretty much, because you'd sing. I might have sang some background vocals, but I'll just stay and do all the guitars. That's the, It would be exactly the same, except we'd both be rich. He goes, nope, I'd be half as rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. He'd be less rich, yeah. So you've played on... Um, I was trying to count. Like, it seems like over 40 or 50 number one songs. Yeah. Just as a player. I was talking to, was it Dan? He was talking about, because he, he had played on so many songs that he would just, he would hear a guitar part and go, oh, yeah, that's really good. And go, oh, that's mine. Like he just that, played. That happened to me recently. Yeah. Played so You're many. talking about Huff? Dan yeah, Huff? Yeah, yeah, Dan yeah, Huff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had played so many and he would and he would play them without the rest of the song. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not sure if the story he was telling me was Paul Abdul but he heard it, and he was like, oh, that song's good. That guitar part's good. And they was like, yeah. no, you played that. Yeah. How did that happen with you? Um, it was recently, actually, because I, I did go through a, a zone where I couldn't tell what guitars were me anymore on stuff. But um, I was in Florida at a water park, wasting time between a hotel and a flight on vacation last year. And I hear the intro to a Tennille Arts song. And it was her recent number one. I hear the guitar. I'm like, oh, that actually sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I'm like, rock my head. I'm like... Oh, wait, 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 what? Yeah, oh, that's me. So it was nice to have that happen again after so long because it was so exciting at first Yeah. when you start hearing yourself. And also, you got to feel like you're pretty good. I doubt myself all the time with things I do. If I were to hear something I didn't know I did and be like, hey, th- that's good, I'd be like, well, maybe I am good. Maybe yeah. that would be like a confident, like a non-egotistical <laughs> conf- yeah, confidence yeah. boost. Yeah, well, it is, it is. Yeah, it's, it's a reminder. Um, you know? I see a lot of nominations for Guitarist of the Year. Have you won any of those? I have not. Seven nominations. Never won. What the heck? Nashville, come on. 
why are they holding it against you? What'd you do? I don't know. I, Listen, I get blackballed from stuff yeah. all the time. Like, but I know what I did. That's I, the difference. I probably turned down the wrong record deal. Yeah, probably. Um, so you're with Al Dean playing in his showcase band. Does that ever uh, mature into you going on the road as part of his actual band? No. In fact, when I quit Big and Rich, she asked me if I'd go on the road with him because I think Jack had quit for a little bit or something. Or no, who, he had somebody else. He, I think he had Danny Rader out. I, I can't remember. It was and Ra- before Jack. Rader goes to, is it Urban now? Where's no, Ra- he's now out with Chesney. Oh, is he, that right? He's been session guru yeah, yeah. the last years. But um, yeah, so Jason asked me to go out on the road with him when I get off the road with Big Rich. I said, nah, man, I'm just going to stay home and work on my, my session career and you know be with my kids. And he's like, all right. And then two or three years later, I take the McGraw gig because I've, was bored and I heard he was looking. I see Al Dean backstage at the ACMs or CMAs. It goes, <laughs> I thought you were going to go on a road. <laughs> so 2012, you you jump in with McGraw. Yeah. When that happens, do you have to audition for that? No, you know, it was cool. You know, my, our first tour with Big and Rich was opening for him. And and I wrote Mississippi Girl, so I had a rapport with him. And, and I had his email and I heard that he was looking. I sent him an email and he said, cool. And he called me. He said, cool, my people will call you. I'm like, all right, rock on. It was that easy. I, it was so awesome. What is it like being with a A-list country artist, front man, alpha? Do you it, do you guys roll together much at all, or does he kind of join you guys? No, I mean, he's so busy, you know, and he can't travel in a regular airport or he'd be hounded, you know. So, you know, he, he rolls on his own time. We get hang time. If it's a full tour, we'll hang every day working out and doing you work, that kind you of work stuff. out with them? Yeah. I mean, every tour, at the end of the tour, I'm in the best shape of my life. And then three months later, I'm going, where'd that guy go? You know. But, Does he ever go, you know what? I'm in a good mood. I'm taking two of you and you can get on the jet and fly home with us. What he took us all to his island, mm. which they don't have anymore, I think. I think That's pretty cool. It. They did sell that. Yeah. 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 We I didn't, bought we it, didn't, actually. So if you, you still want to go. Oh, yeah. I'd love to, yeah, man. Still wanna yeah. Go, actually, I, mean, I buried you know. something by the wow. first palm tree by the dock to the left. But no, man, that was cool. We didn't all go together as a band. I think we all went on three separate occasions. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, once in a while, we'll, if, you know, if something important comes up, he'll let you hop on the jet with him. You know, but he's he's pretty private. He's just you yeah, know, he works his ass off. Do you still practice? No, not not really. Occasionally, I might like put something on a song that I've never learned the guitar licks from and just kind of see what they are and maybe put that into my arsenal a little bit. But I don't really practice that much. What years were your most formative where you practiced all the time? That would be the early teens. Would you just yeah. go into a room or a, and just and you just oh, yeah. wouldn't leave? Oh, yeah. A sleeve of saltine crackers and a tall glass of orange juice. And a four-track recorder, and I was up in my bedroom every day, you know, just shredding. I was into, like, Yngwie Malmsteen and, you know, like the prog, uh, progressive neoclassical guitar playing. I don't know if you know any of that. I don't know what any of that. I don't even know Steve what the words Vi, you're saying right Steve, yeah. okay, all now, the two-hand now tapping. Now and, I know some of that. Dude, I was, like, I was making epic recordings on my four-track. Were your parents ever like, hey, um, why don't you go do something outside? No. Really? That's no. cool. They didn't even yell at me when I listened to... King Diamond, and I don't even know if you know who that is. But I don't, but I just be it's quiet. Not, it's yeah. not wholesome music. That's all I'll say about that. Okay, so <laughs> we, you've been extremely influential on in the sound of other folks' music. You've toured with some of the biggest names in country music, but then you, you're putting your own music out. So let me play some of The Sky is Falling Down, just because it's the first track, and I'll start there. Mike, if you'll hit that, please. The sky is falling down. So when you go into a a project, are you thinking, okay, it all needs to, and I hate to use the term fit into a certain box, but are you looking for some, some overall aesthetic, like what it needs to look this way, feel this way, say, or is every track just completely different? It's different. And I finally embraced that. That's what kept me from doing this for so long is that I didn't know what I did. And I wrote so many different songs. I didn't think I could put them all together. And this was finally the first time in my life I went, oh, these are all different, 
but they're all me, and I can stand behind every one of these. What's the ultimate goal with putting out your own body of work? I, I just want to add add what I do as an artist into what I do for a career, you know, just ever so slightly. If I can, you know, as I'm coming down from being the guitarist for everybody, lift up a little bit as an artist and add it all together, you know, and maybe when I retire, go, be able to play to 100 people in a club that know my songs, that'd be cool. You know? Do you want to Or not, more, I'll take more. Do you want to not be the guitarist anymore? I crave that, yes. I, I like singing. I like singing the songs. And, and occasionally... It's more inspiring to shred to one of my own songs out of the blue, and it's a little more free for me to play a solo on one of my songs because I'm so busy thinking about the singing that when it's finally time to play, it's a little more free. You know, it's a little less restrained. So my theory is, because it's all about my theories, that you're so good at something, you're now bored with it. You could say that, yeah. 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 That you have, in your mind, mastered what you set out to do. yeah. And you still got to pay the bills, and you still love playing music. And I do. You got a wife, and you got kids, and you got real world. And you got, but, okay, I did it. Yeah, I mean, and I want to keep doing it. It's not the boredom doesn't keep me from wanting to do, wanting to do it, but you know, you got to find ways to keep it exciting. And honestly, doing my own stuff reminds me that when I'm playing on somebody else's stuff that it means as much to them behind the glass that's as good. mine does to me. And that's that's kind of it's really helped me in all aspects doing my own music. That's, you know? that's a really cool thought because I bet when you do it, and I do things over and over too, right? And, yeah. But I at times have to be reminded that it means something special to somebody the first time they're hearing it or they wait. Even though I do it 10,000 times, they may only hear it twice. Right. And so you doing your music reminds you how the artist feels. Exactly. Which probably eliminates that, okay, here we go again. Totally. Somewhat, somewhat. No, it totally does. Yeah. It totally does. Yeah, yeah. I, I only get that here we go again feeling when it's really a bad day, which is rare in this town. So. Uh, it's a little less than rare for me sometimes. Yeah, uh, boing, uh, ding. <laughs> Let me play, and I'll ask you a question about the lyrics here, but this is 11. Mm. She takes it to 11. So taking it to 11 to me is a spinal tap reference. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... Ten, the, uh, is that... To, it, it's not no. necessarily, but yeah, I mean, it, it is for sure. You know, that's kind of what put that on the map. But, um, you know, that that's... You chose two Dino Brown, Katie Cook, Adam Schoenfeld written songs. Um, Dino and I will go walking on the road every morning. You know, sometimes it's just me and him. Sometimes it's other people too. But... It's nothing for one of us will say something silly and all of a sudden we have a song idea. And him and I were walking one day and I went, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that came out, you know, and we went with it. It was just weird. With these but, songs, did you write them for yourself or did you write them to write them and then go, wow, I think this is actually for me? Um, wrote them to wrote them to write, wrote them to wrote them, wrote them to write them. Um yeah, but I kind of, I think by the time we were writing 11, I knew we were, and actually both of those, I knew we were writing for me. You I'm going to play her song, which we talked about Katie, but yeah. is this about Katie? Sure is. All right, here you go. Here's her song. I spent a lifetime looking for you. I knew if I found you, I'd adore you. Some people never find it. Fast forward all rewinding. I never take for granted that you're mine. I spent a lifetime. That is her song. Uh, the album, All the Birds Sing. You can get it now. Everywhere you can get it digitally. Yeah, right? It's yeah, all just I, and whatever I, uh, your streaming services. Through uh, my website, you'll be able to get CDs soon. It was just a digital release. And what's your website? AdamSchoenfeld.com. And will you sell? Will you sign them? I will. Make an extra nickel? Be like, I will. I'll sign this In one. In fact, I've started setting it up that way. You're a genius. Do you have, uh, do, you, do you hear songs? Again, you mentioned the Tinnell Arts song. Do you hear songs at times and go, oh, yeah, I forgot I even did that song? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> I would imagine when you do so many, because, again, we're talking yeah. about the big hits, but I'm sure you've played on 
There's tons of album tracks. That, yeah, there's a lot of cuts out there that just weren't huge hits. Yeah. I mean, that would be crazy to be like, oh, wait. Oh, yeah, I did yeah. I did do that. Or someone goes, hey, you played on this, and you're like, oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, the people that got the brunt of that was my kids. One of my last memories of being with my daughter when I heard a song I played on, we walked into the orthodontist, sat down. As soon as we sat down, a Jason song comes on, and I look at her. She looks over at me, and she goes, don't. <laughs> <laughs> how did you, and to bring this back full circle a little bit, but how did you pass the information or the advice Jay Joyce gave you down onto a younger player? Oh, you know what? Um, this guy was playing actually on a Big and Rich record, a later Big and Rich recording with me, and I'm literally getting ready to play a guitar solo, and he is looking over the other side of my pedal board, and he asked me a question about the pedals. He says, so what are you doing with this, this pedal and this pedal? And I just looked up, like, man, just get your own thing. <laughs> And he's like, man, that guy, that was a douche thing to say, but yeah, it really is, yeah. it's really going to create my, yeah. my future. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, what if you play and the artist goes, you know what, I'm, I have second thoughts about this solo. Does anyone ever call you back in to fix? Uh, uh, usually it's on the spot. Oh. Yeah, yeah. usually it's right then and there. They kind of make the decision. But they wouldn't um, call, like, on a, you cut it on a Tuesday and they call you next Monday and go, you know, we changed our mind. Would you come back in? I don't remember that happening, but it's probably because they called somebody else. You know, I mean, a lot of times they'll do that. They'll be like, well, he didn't quite get what we wanted. Why don't we try so-and-so? Which happens to all of us. Do you get paid more if it's a single versus a cut? Much like... No. Uh, well, there are royalties now, a little bit of royalties. But not enough to change your life? Um, on number ones, it, it's, a really? nice, it's a nice chunk. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. So you yeah. hope to get the big artist calling oh, yeah. you. yeah, absolutely. If Aldine goes to the studio, do you expect a call? Uh. At this point, yeah. I mean, but then again, you know, going into the next one would be record 11. So, you know, if I don't, I'd probably be like, I get it. Yeah. They might be doing something new, you know. What's the most expensive guitar that you have ever played? Mm. Well, at the time I played it, it wasn't that expensive, but it technically would be. It was a uh, 61 Strat, but I was playing it in the early 90s. So it probably wasn't worth as much as it would be now. Uh, yeah, again, you're talking. I need to get Rosetta Stone. Sixty-one Fender Stratocaster. Now that I know, but yes. I don't know how why sixty-one's cool. Well, or the, it? the early '60s, yeah. late '50s, all those guitars, those years are where they're really valuable. And I'm, you know what? To be honest, I couldn't really give you too much detail on that. I'm, I'm the guy that like. What's the rough it? price on that thing though? Right now. Right now. Right now. Sixty-one all. Close to original. I, this is a guess because I'm really not a guitar nerd. I'm gonna guess thirty, forty grand, maybe. I could be wrong, but I mean, burst less Pauls, fifty nine Pauls are like three hundred thousand. But I'm, I've never okay. played one of those. Would you, if someone said, "Hey, this guitar is a million dollar guitar," would you say, "Let me play it," or no, don't, I don't want to touch it? I would, I would probably play it and go, "It's not worth a million dollars." Just, when you were working at the guitar store and you'd hear musicians come in, were you, was somebody ever really, really good? There was a kid, you're like, dang, son, keep going. No, I don't yeah. like it. Because one time players. I went in and I did that, and you didn't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I played and I really tried to get your attention. You're yeah. like, you're like, no, you suck, dude. No, man. You're, you're like, get a court from yeah, Walmart. Yeah, go, go into radio. Uh, Reed, <laughs> it is now time for your one question oh, here we go. with here we go. Adam. Oh, what do we got, bro? So if you're in a room writing with others, um, do they consider you as pretty much like the guitar guy to come up with the licks and stuff? Or are you pretty predominant in like all Wow, aspects? yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's kind of changed through time. Um, now, I would say, I would say when we're writing country music, I'm more of the producer writer. Um, oh, okay. You know, like I come at it from that aspect a little more. All right. um, when it's something like I would put on my record... Yeah, I'm kind of, I kind of, almost bull, take the alpha role a little bit sometimes. Yeah. You got the home you studio know? thing going. Yeah, you know, when you got the van and the yeah. place to rehearse, you can alpha. Right. You, you can push people around, get up on your box. You know. <laughs> <There> you <go. laughs> what do you pl you play guitar? Obviously. Yeah. Uh, but you still play drums at all? You still I, I play a little drum. I played drums on a few of the songs mm -hmm. on on there. Uh, I tried. Uh, on the two songs, Sky is Falling Down 11, I tried to play drums, and at the end I realized I had to fix them too much, so I couldn't put something I had to fix on there. I got a real drummer to 
lay them in there for me. Um, but so that's kind of self-taught through the years. So if it's a simple groove, I play drums. I play some keyboards. I play bass, you know. If you, you know. play guitar at a high level, can you play bass automatically? No. You can, I mean, you can keep a simple bass line, but there's, there's an art, you know, to doing a great bass line. And sometimes, I think great bass players do it all the time. I once in a while can come up with a cool bass line for my own stuff. If yeah. you're on the road and, and your bass player in McGraw's band goes down, mm -hmm. they're like, we need you to fill in on bass the whole show mm -hmm. tonight. Could you get by? I think so, yeah. Dang, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That you could just go and figure out every... I'm yeah. Like, you don't have to dominate like he would, but it's no. just like get no. by and could, Yes, absolutely. What if the keyboard player went down? No. Okay. <laughs> Unless I could transpose and put everything in the key of C. <laughs> uh, so, okay, you, you have the, this record. Are you... Maybe you're going to go play some shows? I would love to. Yeah, we, we were just at that point where um, we had to f figure out what's going on with McGraw's schedule. Once I know exactly what's up with that, I know the holes that I can book for myself for the year. Um, and this is new for me, having a project that I'm like totally want to go out and tour if I could. Yeah. So so working on finding help with that and, and getting some stuff booked. So Has McGraw been doing shows with that big beard? We did a couple, yeah, because he was in the middle of filming. Yeah, like so. 1883, then yeah. he pops out and does a show. Yep. Does he ever go, I got to go to the bathroom, just give me an extra long solo? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the old days before I was in the band. Yeah. Yeah. There are times, if we're like doing some band stuff with our comedy group, um, where there have been games on, and I would need to go check a score, or I'd come out mm -hmm. late, I would be like, guys, you got to go kill, you got to go do do your right, thing. Right. This is your time to shine. Yep. And let's just act like you're doing it, and it's not me back there watching, you know, the last three minutes of the game. That's great, yeah. Uh, McGraw never does that, huh? No, he's really. never like I need to watch the LSU game. No. You guys, well, we've got a guy that can talk to us in our ears, and I have heard thirty-four to twenty-one. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before for sure. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Well, listen, we get updates real time. I, uh, I'm rooting for you. Mm. I think it's really cool. That, Thanks, man. That, you know, you go. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna re-vulnerable myself. Yeah, it's different. It's a different feeling. Because you're already King Dingling at playing the guitar. <laughs> oh, King Dingling. Yeah. But now it's it's not that you're starting over, but to some people as an artist, you're, they're like, Adam, you do this? I mean, it's you kind of going. I, I do feel like a kid again. Yeah. Like, yeah. here's kind of my guts and yeah. my heart and what I'm thinking, and I've put it into this art, and yeah. if you get some time, listen to it. Yep. Yeah. I've had a couple times recently live stream in a show where I was nervous like I was 14 again. And I loved it. Yeah, because you know? you get to be excited. Ner yeah. Nerves are because it's important. Right. It can be good or bad. True. But nerves are because whatever's about to happen is important to you. And, you know, mentoring on American Idol, the, the one thing that they would come to me and go, hey, how do I not be nervous? And I would go, well, first of all, you should acknowledge the fact that it's awesome to be nervous. Like right. You don't have many times in your life where you get to be nervous about something that could possibly be amazing. That's a good point. Most times you get nervous because something bad could happen. But yeah. you get to be nervous because you're getting a shot at something big. Worst case scenario, you end up right where you are right now. That's worst case. You don't go backward. Worst case is right. you're in the same sp Best case is your life has changed doing something you love. Yeah. So first acknowledge that pretty cool you get to be nervous. Second of all, you don't just heal nerves. You know, nerves are are eliminated because you put yourself in that same spot over and over again. But never forget how awesome it is to be nervous at doing something you love. And it's cool that you, a veteran, yeah. a guitar master, get to be nervous again. Yeah, it's interesting. It's really cool. How about that perspective? Boom. That is. That. Boom. That's Come some, on. wow. Drop that on that's you. Some deep yeah, caca. That's right. All right, look, uh, you guys can follow Adam uh S, I'm going to spell it for people so they can find it easier because your name is said different than it looks. Just go to Shoe Enfeld. Show Enfeld. Yeah, but yeah. Shoe, yes, yeah, but I'm spelling Enfeld. it out on Instagram. Yeah, absolutely. Show, the letter N, Feld. Boom. Wait, Shoe. 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 Now See, I'm screwing now myself you messed up. it all up, I go man. all deep. I'm like Socrates oh. and I can't spell. <laughs> shoe. Just go look up Al Demiola. There you go. What? Um, Adam Schoenfeld. There he is. <laughs> Follow him on Instagram. Shoe in Feld, which is Schoenfeld, his last name. Hey, thanks for coming by, Thank man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you and having me. And tell your, your wonderful wife I said hello. I will. Uh, kick my girl on the balls for me. I will. I owe him a couple of those. I will. And uh, 
you guys check out the record. You know, you heard some of it here, but it's up. He's proud of it. I think you'll like it. All the birds sing. It's 10 songs, and it's him going, all right, here I am again. Let's go. Let's do this. And I hope you get to go play some shows. Thanks, man. That'd be pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, me too. All right. Uh, thanks, man. Appreciate you, brother. That was awesome.